Thank and you. with that, we are going into the next session um, where we have uh, uh, Mr. Salman Kushit and Professor John Burgess uh, talking about arguably the most difficult issue today uh, in the la next two days, which is the future of India. I congratulate both of them on their uh, bravery <laughs> um, in tackling such a bravery or uh, I don't know foolhardiness <laughs> in venturing where angels fear to tread so rather you than me um, with uh, your permission uh, uh, Professor John Verghese principal of St. Stephen's can we uh, let uh, Mr. Kushit go first and uh, most certainly most certainly I'm quite, uh, I'm quite happy if my Alma Mater's principal goes first. I have no issue at all. No issue at all. The uh, principal Mr. Kushid, has... please go ahead. Okay, uh, Mr. Kushid, um, yeah. uh, let me just give a. I know he requires very little uh, um, um, what do you call uh, introduction, um, but uh, for the form's sake, um, he is now what is called a designated senior advocate that the highest advocates at the Supreme Court level uh, of India. He's an eminent author, a law teacher, and um, um, he has been Minister for Law and Justice and External Affairs, uh, besides being at different times Corporate Affairs Minister, uh, Minorities uh, and Commerce, um, all while belonging and continuing to belong to the Indian National Congress. Um, he was uh, a union deputy minister for commerce. That was his first uh, stint in the in the government of India in June 1991, and became uh, minister of external affairs in 1993. He was born in Aligarh in Uttar Pradesh state of India. Uh, he is uh, of a distinguished lineage, son of Mr. Krishid Alam Khan, former union uh, minister of state for external affairs. Um, and the grandson of Dr. Zakir Hussain, the third president of India. He is of, uh, as I mentioned before, of Patan descent, tracing his ancestry to the Afridi and Kishigi tribes of Afghanistan, if I'm not mistaken. He studied at St. Saviour's High School, Patna, Delhi Public School, and then went on to uh, what shaped, I think, largely his uh, development as an adult which is St. Stephen's College, uh, of which the principal here is seated. Um, and uh, then onwards to St. Edmunds Hall, uh, St. Edmunds Hall, uh, Oxford University. And then he taught law at Trinity College, Oxford also. He started his career in 1981 on his return to India as an officer on special duty in the Prime Minister's office under the Prime Ministership of Mrs. Indira Gandhi. He has been the president of Uttar Pradesh Congress twice, president of the Delhi Public School Society, and the doc Dr. Zakir Hussain uh, Study Circle. Um, he has been also, in spite of all these activities, also been involved in writing and acting in plays since his student days in Delhi and Oxford. He's the author of the play, uh, widely staged uh, in India and abroad, called Sons of Baba. Um, and, um, and made a statement of intent, I think, in his equally wi widely received uh, book, At Home in India. Um, he's prolific and he's published several other books. Um, so here is um, uh, Mr. Salman Kurshid. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Moses. It's uh, uh, it's an honor to be to be here at this very very important important uh, web conference, uh, particularly because uh, Professor Verghese is here, uh, and that uh, makes me both nostalgic as uh, as indeed self conscious about what one can say uh, in the in the presence of the head of uh, one's uh, alma mater. Be that as it may, we are here to look forward to the future and the future of India, the future of our country, the future of uh, uh, the uh, 
the people of, of this country. And uh, I can at best begin uh, with, a, uh, with a prayer that, uh, uh, that let my uh, country awake um, to join, join the prayer of uh, none other than, than uh, the great poet Rabindranath Tagore. The uh, uh, the actual uh, understanding and perception uh, that one one has today of our future uh, is somewhat mixed. It is mixed for the reason uh, that we have come a long way on the path of discovery, the path of accomplishment, the path of growth, and the path of uh, of, uh, of consolidation of dreams of uh, our founding fathers, the, the uh, generation of, of uh, remarkable people who struggled for independence and who indeed succeeded in giving us independence. And to give it in a manner which is perhaps uh, unparalleled anywhere, anywhere in the world. Uh, both in terms of the level of participation, the size of participation, but also because it was wedded and welded to uh, nonviolence and, and to a moral idea of struggle that uh, we, we imbibed from none other than Mahatma Gandhi. So there is much to be satisfied with much to celebrate and, and much uh, to congratulate ourselves for. But while that is true, as I said, the mixed feelings come from the uncertainty of the, about the future. Many of your discussions in this, uh, in this conference uh, relate to the uh, participating and participation in the future of strategic affairs in the world. Uh, and how India would play and ought to play a very important, significant role. And there is no denying this fact. But I think no matter, no amount of, of window dressing of uh, our conditions and situation will take away from our knowledge and realization and uh, um, and an acceptance of a truth that despite the remarkable advances that we have made, the, the, the fact that we've arrived at the high table of world governance virtually, uh, certainly in terms of the presence at G20, but also uh, the emerging consensus that India should be at the high table or the permanent table, as it were, of the United Nations. Despite all that, we still know about problems at home. There are problems still of poverty. I might not add to that word uh, the problems of hunger. Uh, we have, in a sense, over the last two decades, we have found uh, uh, some solutions, some solutions to hunger, particularly with the, uh, the, uh, the food security infrastructure that we provide provided in place uh, which in fact was was very very severely tested uh, during the early weeks of the pandemic that we are now facing of covid 19 uh, the lockdown and the consequences and implications of that lockdown were many but one of those was about food security and you know people rushed to the supreme court uh, for uh, for some relief, people uh, uh, went to parliament for some relief. People uh, implied impl pleaded with government for for relief. And finally, I believe if we look back over the difficult weeks of the pandemic and the lockdown, uh, we can see that there were there was a stress in terms of food security. Uh, there were concerns in terms of food security and undoubtedly there would have been slippages in terms of food security that we still haven't uh, got enough data on. But there was no 
real cause of widespread panic. I mean, there was no repeat of the uh, Bengal famine, as it were, uh, and the consequences of that uh, in, in, in modern times. Yet we know, yet we know from uh, what we experienced, both in terms of food security, also in terms of what the crisis, uh, the, the migrant labor had to go through, uh, we do realize that there is still in terms of the social safety net that the previous governments have tried to put in place, there are still gaping holes. Um, and those gaping holes have to be addressed. And that obviously uh, puts question marks on our future, not in terms of a lasting uh, impact, but certainly in terms of high priority that has to be, that has to be addressed. Uh, this particular week, there is a debate in, in the country about priorities. Now, there are some people who believe that our commitment to democracy and our commitment to parliamentary democracy requires us to, to support the government's decision to uh, build a new parliament house. Uh, this is not something that the, uh, the government has pulled out of a hat to be fair to the government. This is something that's been discussed and in sort of uh, debated for, for a while. It's just that it's been given concrete shape with a sense of urgency by the present government. But there are people, there are people who believe that this could wait, particularly at the, the time in which it has come, uh, the time of pandemic, the need for, need for revival of the Indian economy, and uh, indeed uh, in terms of the uncertainty that still stalks us uh, for, uh, for 10 years or five years ahead uh, from now. So there are two views, but then there are two views on everything in our country, and that may not be a bad thing uh, overall in a democracy for us to disagree, to debate, to, uh, to have a wide discourse before the dialogue comes to an end with a conclusion or some kind of a decision, uh, which has been the strength of India and must remain the strength of India in times to come. The, uh, the uh, endorsement of this view of India and this strength and vitality of India has in recent years and recent months come from the Supreme Court repeatedly in remarkable judgments on liberty, remar remarkable judgments on participatory governance, remarkable judgments on the dignity of the citizen or the human being, uh, on, on the idea of privacy, on the idea of fundamental rights as a whole, and the, the nature of interface between fundamental rights of an individual and the expectations and demands of, uh, of people uh, at large. Uh, these are still open-ended questions that year in years to come, the courts will have to decide uh, to what extent can fundamental rights be qualified by way of reasonable restrictions, uh, read with the doctrine of proportionality, as the Supreme Court has often said, what extent can fundamental rights of an individual be qualified or diluted uh, in view of what are the demands, expectations, and needs of society at large? These are still open-ended questions. Uh, the courts have periodically, and certainly in specific subjects, uh, either uh, leaned in some periods towards society and in some periods towards the individual, a lot to do with the actual ambience in which those decisions are taken. But as we look at the future of this country, I believe there is going to be a very important, important input and an important provision that will come by way of how we see the relationship of the individual with society. That's very, very significant. Individual versus society. And I said the pendulum has swung from, from point to point. Now, it would be, I believe, 
an important decision in the next few years, perhaps five years, ten years, for this country to finally end up with a consensus that today I'm afraid is missing, a consensus of what kind of society we want to live in. Are we going to be living in a society where individuals are put at the highest or are we going to be living in a society where the, the greatest good of the greatest number will prevail? This is a critical philosophical political decision that our country will take in the next few years, I believe, either explicitly by way of uh, an electoral verdict, uh, given that electoral verdicts sometimes are not so clear about a particular proposition because many, many factors get into an electoral verdict or not of electoral verdict by, but by way of an institutional decisions, decision that comes from uh, largely from the courts of our country who would be conscious and sensitive to the feeling that there is amongst ordinary people, but would end up within uh, taking a decision within the four corners in the structure of what has recently been described as constitutional morality. Essentially, the very value system that is sustained by the constitution, that is created or preserved by the constitution, and which the judges periodically have to discover or rediscover and then transform that into specific applications of facts that arrive before the courts from time to time. So that, I believe, is going to be the major movement forward in the next 10 years. And there, of course, uh, to put it, put it in as neutral terms as possible, there will be a critical decision also about the cultural backdrop of India's movement forward. The cultural backdrop will have a lot to do, lot to do with what would be the defining intellectual deity of our future. Will it be the Gandhian approach, which has Swaraj, which has, uh, which has Swabhiman, uh, which has uh, non-violence, Satyagre, uh, which has Ahinsa. Uh, will it be uh, a humanistic, humanistic approach to the future? And that humanistic approach cannot be limited to ourselves alone, but will have to be, will have to permeate India's approach to the world and how India wants to see the world. It can't be that we are humanistic, civilizationally ourselves, but do believe in some different kind of distorted vision of the world. So that's one critical, one critical option that will be, will have to be decided. Or will there be, will there be, or is there, I stand to be corrected if I uh, do not formulate this right. Is there an alternative idea of India to the idea of India that is associated with Mahatma Gandhi and subsequently uh, qualified to some extent, qualified or supplemented, I guess that's the better word, supplemented by Jawaharlal Nehru and then what has followed in the Nehruvian vision of uh, first socialist India, uh, sometimes misdescribed as being a socialism of the kind we've known from other parts of the world, but uh, truly to be social democratic India, which finally translated into the India of empowerment, India that gave the ordinary citizen full empowerment to enjoy the benefits of growths of our society, but also participate in deciding which direction society is to take. Now, that being one option, will there be an another option that is variously talked about in recent times? Some speak of uh, a particular Indian version of, of uh, 
of civilizational approach where a particular dimension of Indian civilization will be the dominant one, will be the, the driving force, etc., giving a special vigor. And uh, some people think that's that vision that would be demonstrated uh, in, in a manner in the kind of re construction of the central vista and the new parliament house now these are still debatable open points that will go on for some time but will have to be considered in due course so the interface of philosophy and electoral politics the interface of uh, an intellectual movement uh, in the country with with the the aspirational aspirational uh, dimension that is recently being talked about uh, um, in view of the emerging new generations of our country is the big thing that the next 10 years pose to us. Now, I'm more interested in all this than interested in the kind of military power that we will have, the kind of footprint that we will have both on soil as in water in the Indian Ocean or in Central Asia, or for that matter, in West Asia and, and Southeast Asia. The trade kind of links that we will have, uh, what relationship we will finally have with China, to what extent will we cede space to China and to what extent will we be able to prevent the, the, uh, the onslaught of uh, Chinese goods and Chinese, Chinese temperament. Uh, these are very, very important issues. But I believe that what is more important is that in order to address these issues, we must first address the issue of what we will be. What will India be 10 years from today? What will be the soul of India 10 years from today? Will there be a transformation that for some of us may well be a transformation not of, of, of great welcome, but a transformation of having lost the very vision, civilizational vision given to us by Mahatma Gandhi, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, and a series of people who followed since then. So it's still, the jury is still out. I, I think it's very, very tough to predict as to the path that we will take. Uh, it will obviously be, uh, and this is the, uh, the, the important condition that we must we must impose is that it will obviously be a democratic decision and a democratic decision will lead us in which way forward is a big question but of course below this there will be under the democratic decision notion there will be this idea that will india be an inclusive inclusive participatory civilizational model or will it become a majoritarian mo model will india follow examples of many other countries that will not or did not have the plural experience that india had from its inception and that india has been very proud of and which hasn't been hasn't been repudiated at least explicitly by any emergent new political forces is a big question and therefore when you ask me the future for India the future for India lies in finding the right answers to this big question thank you very much ladies and gentlemen may I just uh, take the liberty of introducing Professor John Burgess principal of uh, perhaps uh, India's uh, foremost uh, liberal arts and sciences college St. Stephen's College New of Delhi. Dr. John Burgess is a product of uh, Chennai's uh, Loyola College, where he completed his uh, bachelor's and master's degrees, and Madras Christian College, where he took an MPhil in English language and literature before beginning his teaching career. Um, at the Central Institute of English and Foreign Languages, Hyderabad, he uh, was awarded his PhD and while doing his PhD, I mean, this is where it gets interesting. He joined the Department of Radio and Television, where he scripted educational radio programs and taught media and communications with a particular focus on educational media. He was also a radio broadcaster working with 
All India Radio as a compare. He spent over 20 years at uh, the CIFL, the Central Institute of English and Foreign Languages in Hyderabad, uh, which is now uh, EFL, uh, it's been renamed, uh, Teaching Media and Communication, English Language as well as English Literature. Over the last decade, Professor Burgess has been involved increasingly with administration and policy. He was in charge of international relations at EFL University and uh, was involved with setting up institutes of English in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, Sudan and Djibouti for the government of India. All countries which are very have uh, since acquired great importance in India's uh, strategic uh, outlook. Um, especially I, if I may say uh, uh, Vietnam and Djibouti for different reasons. So may I present to you Professor John Burgess on his view of the future of India with a strong emphasis as is expected on education as a cornerstone for its future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manoharan, and uh, please accept my congratulations on this two-day event, which brings together people to share their ideas in keeping with the good values that the Global Dialogue Forum continues to propagate. Please accept my congratulations, you and your team. Thank you. Uh, today I'm going to talk about very briefly the future of India and uh, I'm sure all of us gathered here online will agree that most revolutions, changes and in fact everything good which matters begins as an idea, a thought. Yanni, the musician, said this too, but much before him, my senior teacher and mentor, Professor Makhanlal Tiku, the linguist and one of the earliest proponents of English language teaching in India, mentioned this idea, that everything begins as an idea. And at this two-day global conference, when we are studying the world, geopolitics, power equations, warfare and security, economics, society and politics, I'm sure I'm going to be seen as a lone voice trying to make myself heard over the accolades of a vaccine being launched, celebrations of petty victories in skirmishes at the borders, and one-upmanship among leaders repeated ad nauseum. And what I have to say is the future of India is the future of the world. I know this is in contrast to what Mr. Kurshid had just said. He had taken a more cautious, very balanced approach, considering the many uh, difficult situations that face us as global citizens. But I'm looking at an optimistic view. And therefore, I say that the future of India is the future of the world. Brave words indeed, you may say, and you are right. These are just words at the moment. The catch, as we all probably know, is in the harsh reality of India as it is today. 
So you can say that the title of this presentation is an aspirational title, but not one that is impossible. It is an idea, but it is an idea that is workable. It is also an idea which is long overdue. It is an idea that not just India, but the whole world can benefit and really make do with. But I would like to start with India. The future of India should be one that is planned, not one that is left to the vagaries of, among other things, political leadership. Mr. Kurshid very beautifully brought out the essence of what his concern is. And I, uh, with his permission, would like to repeat that question. What is the consensus that we as a country want? And he went on and spoke about the inclusive, participatory, and civilizational model that this country has traditionally promoted. At this Global Dialogue Forum, over yesterday and today, we had leaders who spoke of how there was a buildup of power, and you can translate that as arms, how this power was being built up in certain parts of the world, because of which there was a tilt in the balance of power. And what pains me is that despite mankind's civilization, we are still trying to understand the world in terms of brute power through the harsh, crude ways of occupying territories, inflicting damage on life and property, and of late, perhaps, of bio-warfare too. In the light of this unabated onslaught of brute power, my question is to all of us, what happened to education? My proposal for global domination is through the vehicle of education rather than an arms buildup. India has a fantastic, varied, multicultural discipline of education. That is a tradition which should be cherished and which should be continued. While this has been a problem for a centralized body like the Ministry of Education, I would like to encourage the view that this need not be a problem. Au contraire, it can actually be an advantage. Today, globally, many Indians head the government sector and the private sector as well. There are many success stories and all of us know about them. But if you observe carefully, you will notice that the initial seeds for their success was planted in their Indian education and culture. A culture that was tolerant, a culture that was inclusive and participatory. This, if we can bring back and bring back to the fore then I can very confidently tell you that the future of India 
will be the future of the world. Today, India has the largest population of young people in the world. This is amazing potential. And we must translate this into something constructive, not just for our country, but for the world. If I am to take a leaf out of the history of college, we will see many eminent and illustrious alumni of the college, including the speaker who went just before me, who in their own small way are trying to make the world a better world. Now that is what is needed. The road to a constructive result, and if you want to call it global domination, should not be a road which is lined with armaments, military buildup, and an aggressive attitude. Education is the answer. All of us have heard this quotation that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. One only has to go through history where we can see several instances of futile attempts at world domination through force. The attempt to thrust one ideology on the world is just not going to work. This is where a democracy is important. And it is very essential to uphold the values that democracy instills and propagates. In India, we are culturally varied, and that for me is a strength rather than a drawback. The strange thing that we in India especially tend to forget is that we highlighted the effectiveness of ahimsa, of nonviolence, the idea of the world as a family. What happened to all of that? Have we put it on the back burner and ha have we got into this rat race of armaments and armaments build up? My plea is that we need to bring back education to the fore. My proposal is this. India has the capability to make a difference to the world. We have a large number of young people. If they can be educated to think right and to do what is right, then the future of India is the future of the world. It's not easy. It calls especially for a political will. It calls for a larger vision of humanity, shared humanity. It calls for hard work on the designing table and even more hard work on the ground. Education with the right values is the key education and not a military solution. I think a start has been made. It's a small start. If you look at our national budget, the national budget, there has been a small increase in the allocation to education. This is what this government has done and I think it's a good thing in the right direction. But the government must not talk, stop with this allocation alone. They should go beyond and ensure 
that what is on paper translates into reality. And that reality should begin in our schools, colleges, and universities. This is an idea, and it is an idea that will work. Global domination, peaceably. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience.